Good morning. And welcome everybody in the sanctuary and on Zoom to First Baptist Church on yet another gorgeous autumn day. Um, our announcements, Tuesday we will be having a memorial service in the sanctuary for Alex Johnson at 2 p.m. And a thank you to all who have volunteered to bring refreshments for after the service. On Tuesday, prayer group will meet at 7 uh, via Zoom, and we'll be discussing the final four chapters in A Praying Life. Thursday, choir practice is at 7 p.m. at the church. And we have lots and lots of October birthdays, it seems. And happy birthday to John Hess today, uh, to Martha Thompson on Tuesday, to my husband, Jim Holden, on Friday, and to Lois Squires on Saturday. And now uh, Matt will introduce the mission moment. Good morning. So last week we had a mini missions moment, but uh, this week we have the, the real one, and we have a special guest with us today. Uh, it's uh, David Wilkinson. He is the executive director at the, the First Step Pregnancy Center in Rutland. So he's going to come and, and share a little bit about what they uh, do there and how they minister to, uh, uh, to women that, that are in crisis. So without further ado, David. Thank you so much. Good morning. It is great to be with you today. Um, as Matt mentioned, my name is Dave Wilkinson. I'm the executive director for First Step Pregnancy Clinic in uh, Rutland, Vermont. Uh, I've been there for about four and a half years. Uh, my wife and I moved there from um, uh, Boise, Idaho, and we first got to to uh, Vermont. I tell you, we love Manchester. We used to come to Manchester like two or three times a week, um, even when we're living in Vermont, uh, in Rutland. And um, we just loved the city, and, but mostly it was because it was the closest Starbucks. <laughs> so, so, but, but now Rutland has their own Starbucks, so we're, we're great about that. But we still love to come to Manchester, and we just love this, this town. Let me share with you a quick story. Uh, she gave me permission to share this. Uh, her name is Jackie, and she came to the clinic because she had been walk in the neighborhood like she always does. She grew up in, in Vermont, and she would walk the neighborhood in Rutland, and there was a person that knew her that followed her. And um, one day, he um, attacked her, and he raped her. It was in broad daylight, because he knew the route she went. He followed her, and then he, he attacked her and raped her in the middle of the day behind a gas station in downtown Rutland. She came to us because she thought she might be pregnant. So we did the pregnancy test, and sure enough, she was. We did the ultrasound to confirm it, and, and she, was, she was pregnant. She went to social services. She went to the police. She did press charges. It was a very courageous thing for her to do because again, this was someone that knew her. Um, but he's in jail now. And people pressured her to have an abortion, because that's what you do, especially if, if you've been raped. And um, some of it, some of the pressure was, was subtle, like the doctors just assuming that would be the next step. Um, others more overt, um, pressure from her family, people like that. But she grew up in a Christian home. She loved God. She didn't understand why this had happened, but she was going to continue to trust God in the midst of her situation. And she said no. And she said, why should I punish, why should the baby be punished for something that the father did? So she continued with her pregnancy. She got lots of support from, from her uh, extended family, from her church family. Um, she actually was living with us for a time uh, during her pregnancy, but then but then she, she moved to a larger place that friends found for her so she would have more, more room for her, for her baby and her dog and her cat. And, uh, and then last month she gave birth to a beautiful, perfect little girl. And she named her Grace. Grace. This child is a gift to her mom. This baby is loved and cherished and beautiful. And mom and baby are thriving. They're, they're doing well. They continue to have good support from her church. And, and she will do well. 
And that is why we exist at First Step, to provide the support and the resources that a person makes, regardless of their decision. If Jackie had chosen a different decision and chose to abort, we would have still loved her. We would have come alongside and cared for her because that's what God has called us to do. Our mission statement is simply, First Step Pregnancy Clinic exists to provide compassionate care and practical support to women and men facing an unintended pregnancy. We offer information, support, and resources in a welcoming and caring environment. Our clients receive, because they deserve, respect, support, and accurate information that is relevant to their needs. We come alongside them for as long as they need us, ensuring that they never feel alone in their journey. We are not political activists, but active advocates for our clients, offering all of our services at no cost. We are a medical clinic operating under, under a licensed medical director, along with trained registered nurses, adhering to all medical guidelines, including HIPAA, to provide excellent care for our clients. As a medical clinic focused on pregnancy and parenting, we provide limited obstetric ultrasounds, pregnancy testing and consultations. We also just hired a nurse manager and we'll be adding STI testing and treatment in the near future. We also provide online in-person and parenting classes and doula services, mentoring for dads, post-abortion recovery and material assistance, including diapers, wipes, baby and maternity clothes, larger items like cribs, strollers, etc. We also just launched a new support group for women and men who have lost a child through miscarriage or stillbirth or infant loss. We call that anchored. Because when you have, we call it anchored because when you have unresolved pain, it can feel like an anchor uh, just kind of dragging you down. In the same way, we also recognize that Jesus is our anchor and we, when we turn to him, he will steady us and he will guide us to those safe places. We are a faith-based 501c3 nonprofit ministry. All of our financial support comes from individuals, churches, and businesses that share our values. Not a dollar comes from the government. Faith is what motivates us and is foundational to how we treat others. We believe that every life matters. Every child conceived is created in the image of God and therefore has inherent worth and value. Being faith-based does not mean that we only serve those who share our beliefs. Our doors are open to anyone who needs us regardless of their faith or no faith. It also doesn't mean that we bludgeon people with the Bible. We don't do that. Again, we treat everyone with respect and dignity and with their permission. Psalm 139, 13 through 16 tells us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made and that our days were formed before one of them came to be. Each of us is created with purpose, on purpose, and for purpose. The Bible also tells us that we need to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. It tells us that in Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. We are to speak up for the victim, the poor, the marginalized, the vulnerable. That includes the mom. It also includes her unborn child. We must come alongside women and men in crisis and offer real solutions and not quick fixes. And that includes building relationships with each and every client. And that's what we at First Step do on a daily basis, every single day. So I invite your prayers, your support, and if you'd like to know, know more, if you'd like to come, if you're in Rutland and you would like a tour of our clinic, I would love to show you around. Uh, I will be available afterwards if you have any questions. And uh, we also have information on Article 22. And I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. I really appreciate that. It's, um, one thing you said in there actually brought back memories from uh, my own childhood. Uh, you talked about having uh, the young woman come in and live with you for a while. Well, my grandmother, uh, she graduated college at the age of 50 with a uh, social work degree and then worked for 25 years in a Catholic social agency. And uh, oftentimes after that uh, time that she graduated, we'd go over to her house and she'd have a young woman living there with her. And the, the care and love and compassion that she demonstrated toward the marginalized uh, was probably no small influence in my own life 
and, and ultimate decision into working in the field of psychiatry, also working with uh, you know, a patient group that is very marginalized. And so it's, it's, it's really great to see that love of Christ in you and your family, David, uh, through my uh, grandmother and then just passed on through the generations. And I, and I hope uh, that, uh, um, that, uh, that we can all just kind of remember that you know, uh, Christ came here to love and, and care for uh, those who are on the margins, those who are on the fringes. And uh, that's kind of uh, what missions is really all about. Uh, thank you. The, um, the word of preparation today is a poem by Christine Woolgar. Uh, Christine Woolgar is a young British poet and activist. She describes herself as a 30-something the theology nerd. Um, she writes poems about all sorts of theological topics, issues, whatever. This one, which is entitled Air, Fire, Water, Clay, is about the Holy Spirit. What are you like, and how shall I describe you? To whom shall I compare you? You are the Lord of sound and song. You hover upon the air and give us breath. You are the Lord of warmth and splendor. You burn with majesty and give us power. You are the Lord of movement and dance. You flow with grace and give us refreshment. You are the Lord of shape and sculpture. You cannot be contained, and yet you reside within our clay. Found in your hands, fullness of joy, every fear suddenly wiped away. Here in your presence All of my gains Now fade away Every crown No longer on display Here in your presence Heaven is trembling in all of your wonders. The kings and their kingdoms are standing amazed. Here in your presence, we are in your presence heaven and earth become one here in your presence all things are new here in your presence everything bows before you
call to worship is from 2 Thessalonians, uh, chapter 1, verses 13 through 17, and please join in reading the bold lines. We always have to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, for you are dearly loved by the Lord. He proved it by choosing you from the beginning for salvation through the Spirit, who set you apart for holiness and through your belief in the truth. To this end, he handpicked you for salvation through the gospel so that you would have the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, dear family, stand firm with a masterful grip of the teachings we gave you, either by word of mouth or by our letter. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ and our Father God, who loved us and in his wonderful grace gave us eternal comfort and a beautiful hope that cannot fail, encourage your hearts and inspire you with strength to always do and speak what is good and beautiful in his eyes. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord and Holy Spirit you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord and Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place in the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord let us become your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness your presence Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place.
place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I see that we have a, a, a couple of people who haven't been here before, so I'll just explain that we are in the middle of a series on discipleship, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, and we're um, learning about this through the book of 1 Corinthians. Last week, we talked about the Lord's table and how he offers us gracious hospitality. In God's design, we also host his presence in our lives as the Holy Spirit comes to live within each one of us who open the door of our hearts to, to welcome him in. In Ephesians 3, 16 and 17, Paul writes about this relationship with God saying, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with the inner strength through his spirit then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him, and your roots will grow down into God's love to keep you strong. God's presence is the very greatest gift in our lives, and yet there's more. That's not all, because he brings us something as he enters. The Holy Spirit essentially brings along host or hostess gifts. Are you familiar with this tradition? Well, when Grace and Arthur were coming to, to move to Maine, they stayed at our house for a couple of weeks during the summer. Maybe you remember that. And then Arthur's family, his mom and dad and sister, also came and stayed with us because they were going to help them move on the next leg of their journey. And so Art and Kathleen and Alyssa came and their presence was their very greatest gift, getting to know them and um, just spend time with them. But they also brought along a hostess gift. And it was some delicacies from the area where they lived in, in near Buffalo in Western New York. And they gave me this bag and it had all these things in it. It was a fun surprise to pull out different bottles and jars. And the one thing that I got most excited about was this basil-infused olive oil. And it inspired me right away to make some focaccia bread to go with the meal I was preparing for them. And they were like, this focaccia bread is amazing. And I said, it's only amazing because of the oil that you gave me. When the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us, he brings, place, he brings gifts from his place of origin, heaven, and brings them to be in our life. And they're meant to not just sit on the shelf, but to be opened and used to share and bless others. And when other people notice that they're amazing, we get to say, it's because the Holy Spirit gave us the gift to share with you. It's not me, it's him. In our passage this morning, we'll hear about some of the gifts the Holy Spirit has given to believers in the church of Corinth, and they're still get being given today. So as Lisa reads 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 11, I invite you to notice how each of these gifts connects heaven to earth. And then think about how have you experienced these gifts in your own life? Or notice them in another person as that glory from God, straight from heaven, shines through. Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshiping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God <clears throat> who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. 
He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So before Paul gets into his section about specific instructions that would allow um, people to use the gifts well, he wants to address the mindset that we have about having gifts from the Spirit. Evidently, people in Corinth kind of misunderstood things in the past, and they were also misunderstanding the origin and the purpose of the gifts now. If you've read the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll know he takes a couple of chapters to kind of sort out how chaotic their worship services have been getting because people are speaking in tongues and nobody knows what they mean and there's just all this noise and it's he said that's not how God designed these to be working but they are good gifts so he does want you to use them it's an important place for us to begin to under to realize we might have misunderstandings about the gifts so that we will have a humble and teachable attitude because we can make make mistakes too misunderstanding where the spiritual gifts originate and how God wants them to be used for his purposes. When we do say something and we believe it is from God, we had better make sure it aligns with God's character and purpose. And we can do that often by checking with his word. Otherwise, if we don't do this, we might be misrepresenting God and we could actually lead people away from God instead of drawing them closer to him. In verse 3, Paul gives an example of the kind of message the Holy Spirit would give us and also he mentions one that the Holy Spirit would never give us. No one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus. Jesus' name is powerful and it is worthy of respect. So it should never ever cross our lips in a way that's disrespectful, nor as a curse word. That kind of message does not originate with our divine advocate. That is from the adversary. And then those words from the Holy Spirit that acknowledge and declare Jesus is Lord, they are the ones that we say when he enables us to recognize that Jesus is Yahweh, the Lord of all. To say and mean Jesus is Lord, we bow before him and give Jesus the throne of our heart. And from that moment on, we acknowledge that the purpose of our life is to serve him because he has redeemed us. God has graciously given us a place in his family and a purpose to fulfill. So when we, when we welcome him as the Lord of our life, he enters with spiritual gifts that will enable us to live out the purpose he has for us. And they will be custom designed for what God has envisioned for you. That means that there will be a diversity of the gifts flowing from one source. Paul states this very beautifully in verses 4 to 6. He says, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does that work in all of us. So just look around for a moment at the people who are here this morning. Do we all look alike? No? We have different features, different colors, different shapes and sizes, different voices, different talents and abilities. Beyond that, we have a variety of spiritual gifts, and that's a good thing. God knows we know, need all different kinds of people and giftings to have a thriving community. Do you remember um, when John Brigham came and preached to you? I think he was last here in the winter time. He's 
He preaches and he smiles a lot and he sings a song that goes with the message. Does that ring any bells? Okay. Hey, yeah, guitar, yes. He prays for our church regularly and he um, meets with the pastors in our area even though he's retired. And he sent me this message that was originally from Rip Warren. He sent it in August and he wanted me to share it with you when the time came and I saved it for today. So here it is. It says, your abilities are God's map for your life. Once upon a time, some animals wanted to start a school. So they decided that their courses would include running, climbing, swimming, and flying. And they decided that all of the animals should take all of the courses. And that is where the problem started. The duck was better than his teacher at swimming, but he only made passing grades in flying and was very poor at running. So they made him drop swimming and stay after school to practice running. And this caused his webbed feet to be badly worn and his grade dropped to average in swimming. But everybody felt less threatened and more comfortable with that, except for the duck. The rabbit started at the top of his class in running, but because of so much makeup work in swimming, he caught pneumonia and he had to drop out of school. The squirrel showed outstanding ability in climbing, but he was extremely frustrated in flying class because the teacher insisted that he start from the ground up rather than the treetop down. He developed a Charlie horse from overextension and he only got a C in climbing and a D in running. The eagle was a problem student and disciplined for being a nonconformist. For instance, in climbing class, he beat all the others to the top of the tree, but he insisted on flying to get there. And finally, because he refused to participate in swimming class, he was expelled. As you might imagine, the animal school didn't work. Different animals are designed to ex excel in specific areas, and they can't be expected to do all the things. A duck is made to be a duck and nothing else. And it's the same for people. God designed each person different from all the others. And when you expect everyone to fit into the same mold, the result is frustration, discouragement, mediocrity, and failure. God made you to be you. He has given you unique abilities, and he wants you to use them the way he intended. Are you wondering about God's will for your life? Look at your abilities. They are your roadmap. They point you in the direction that you should go. And when you know what you're good at, then you can know what God wants to do in your life. The Bible says, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. Through your abilities, God has equipped you to do his will. And as you use those abilities, you'll start to see how he produces every good thing in your life. I would like to add to this gift of a story that God gives us both natural abilities, instincts, and, and interests, and the Holy Spirit also gives us special gifts that are the way we connect with heaven and bring the divine goodness and wisdom and power to the earth. They kind of combine and come together. Often the gifts complement our natural God-given abilities, but sometimes they can have a surprising and transforming effect in our lives. For instance, I think you've met my dad, and if anyone had ever asked him as a teenager growing up to give a speech, he would be like, knocking knees and hate it. The whole experience would make him sick to his stomach. But once he surrendered his life to the Lord, God called him to be a preacher. And now if you give him the pulpit, he is so happy. <laughs> it was much like that for me too. I, I might not have had shaking knees, but I would like get this red coming up my neck to my face whenever I had to do a speech because I didn't like it at all. I never dreamed I would give sermons when I, when I grew up, but evidently, God did. 
We don't need to compare ourselves with each other or compete or copy each other. Whatever we do with the gifts is not for our own self-esteem or glory. It's for God's. And Paul adds, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. So at this point, you might be curious about what your spiritual gift is. Maybe when you heard the passage read, one stood out to you. It's possible that God's even given you more than one spiritual gift, but probably not all of them. If so, it's not because God loves you more and you got more gifts or thinks you're more special than anyone else. Grace is just unpredictable. Verse 11 says, it is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. Whatever the Holy Spirit has given to you is perfectly suited to the work that God has called you to do. And that work becomes your vocation, whether or not you're paid to do it. In the Pathways Resource for the Care of the Soul, pastor, spiritual director, and teacher Jeremy Stefano wrote, a vocation is a calling to do one's share in the work of God. The first vocation mentioned in the Bible involved doing work similar to that of park rangers, tending to animals and beautiful landscapes. From there, the work expanded to shipbuilding and masonry, to artistry and accounting, to management of the home, to administration of the homeland. Added to this is the mission of the Messiah, proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom to captives and reversing the effects of sin and accompanying injustice on the earth. As God calls people, he equips them for their vocation with talents, inclinations, and spiritual empowerment. Then God calls out from us what he has seeded into us. Living in one's calling will involve using the gifts God has given. My vocation is not for me. It is for others. If I set out to attain something exclusively for myself with the gifts God's given me, it's a dismal business. What God has called and gifted me to be and do is for the blessing and benefit of others. With all of this in mind, let's explore the gifts that Paul gave us in this letter. And, and we'll mention a few from um, another letter at the end. The first one I noticed was the ability to give wise advice. I really liked the note on the Passion Translation for this one. It says, this is a revelation gift of the Holy Spirit to impart an understanding of strategy and insight that only God can give. This is more than simply common sense or wisdom, but the clearly crafted word of wisdom to unlock the hearts of people and free the corporate body to move under God's direction. They gave an example under this note of when Jesus used a word of wisdom. Do you remember when he came to Nathaniel and said, I saw you under the fig tree? And that was like the world's shortest sermon. And it was all Nathaniel needed. It unlocked his heart because he realized in that word that Jesus shared with him, which would make no sense to anyone else, right? If I said that to you, would you be like, yes, now I know what to do. Nathaniel knew this was God in the flesh. Only God knew that, what he was wrestling with under the fig tree in that moment. And so he followed the Messiah from then on. If you have the gift of the word of wisdom, it's important to keep the channel clear between you and God because both the word and the wisdom come from God, not us. You're just chosen to listen for it, receive it, and then share it for the good of others. And then there's a message of special knowledge. It sounds pretty similar to the word of wisdom, doesn't it? The note in the Passion Translation says it could be an impression, a vision, a voice of the Spirit given through divine understanding of a person, a situation that cannot be known through the natural mind. I had a 
different story, but I changed it yesterday when I read um, something from Guideposts this week. It was written by Catherine Hutchinson Hayes. Um, this lady had gone through two failed marriages and she decided that she couldn't really trust her own instincts so much in this department. And she wanted to wait for God's leading the next time. And she had come to this point of surrender and she went to um, a singles like retreat at her church where there was a guest pastor. And he had 11 ways that were helping her to draw close to God, to her children, and to really get to know herself and enjoy being herself. And she pulled a paper bag out of her purse and wrote an eyeliner, these 11 things. And she really wanted God to make it clear to her. And God gave her another word of knowledge this day, something that the, the man never said. She heard it deep in her spirit. It was just believe. Okay? So after three um, years of moving towards wholeness, working these steps and, and um, everything, she met a man named Tony, and she felt this instant connection. And on their first date, they were dancing, and he pulled her close, and he said, just believe. She was like, oh, that's the word God gave me. And she didn't say anything to him, but she asked God, is he the one? Help me to be sure. Well, that was a Saturday night, and the next morning in church, a young woman whom she'd never met before was kind of looking nervous but not moving out of the end of the pew so she could get out, and she shared this message that she had received from God for Catherine, someone she didn't know. She said, you've been praying for a godly husband, a protector, a man of integrity and honor. God has heard all of your prayers, and they will be answered speedily. The man God has chosen for you, you just met or will meet soon. Just believe. She, met, she didn't tell anyone, not even Tony, for another four months, but after he asked her to marry him, she did kind of confirm it with this. And they have been married for over 14 years very happily. God speaks in surprising ways, and he will give us words of wisdom or words of knowledge if we really listen with a willingness to follow it. The third gift I see in the passage is great faith. Uh, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. So I believe a person who has this spiritual gift has a special ability to look beyond the things right in front of them, all the solid things or all the problems or all those things that we try to buy to make us feel secure. And they look past those things and see what is of eternal value. And when they live and they speak from that place, we can see it too. And we can move with them towards what God is calling us to do. We, like the person of great faith, will be encouraged to keep our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. We'll see what Christ is doing. We'll see what our invitation to join in looks like. And we can celebrate with the person of faith. I hope that we can do this for each other. Then there's the gifts of healing. Do you ever get discouraged about your own body breaking down and all the brokenness that we find in the world? There are so many places that need divine healing, and God shares his healing power with the world through his people in many different ways, but it is always done in close connection with the Lord, and it, it involves prayer. Sometimes prayer is all that we are asked to do in participating in someone's healing, and other times God will use prayer and a touch like Jesus did when he walked among people. He often touched them as part of their healing. James 5, 14 to 16, sheds light on how a healing gift looks in a church community. It says, are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. 
the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. The power to heal does not originate in the person who is praying. It doesn't come from the oil that might be used for anointing. It always is coming from heaven and flowing through whatever source God chooses to give to the person who needs the healing. Did you notice that healing also involves confession and forgiveness? Telling the truth, repenting, and receiving and giving forgiveness is a form of healing that we are all invited to do. Forgiveness is all about receiving that grace gift of God that flows from the heart of the Father through the sacrifice of the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think forgiveness is the biggest healing force in the world. How about that one, the power to perform miracles? Would anyone, if I asked you right now, would you raise your hand and say, yes, I have the power to perform miracles. What are miracles? They are extraordinary and astonishing happenings that are attributed to the presence and action of an ultimate or divine power. They are something God can do. And God is full of miracles, and God is full of surprises. And sometimes they are very big, and sometimes they are small. In the Daily Bread devotional entitled God in the Details, Tim Gustafson wrote about a family who was struggling. It had been an awful week for Kevin and Kimberly. Kevin, the dad, his seizures had suddenly worsened, so now he was hospitalized. Amid the pandemic, their four young children, siblings adopted from foster care, were taking cabin fever to a new extreme. Can you picture the situation? <laughs> On top of that, Kimberly couldn't scrounge up a decent meal from the fridge. Oddly, at that moment, she craved carrots. An hour later, there was a knock at the door, and there stood their friends, Amanda and Andy, with an entire meal that they'd prepared for the family, and guess what it included? Carrots. Making a meal might not seem like a miracle, but for Kimberly, it was more than food, wasn't it? It was a sign that God saw her and cared about her and knew her intimately and was working to provide for what she needed, that she was not alone. And if we are in tune with the Holy Spirit, we can be part of a miracle in someone else's life. It's getting late and we have more. Let's put them together. Gifts six to nine, the ability to prophesy, to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God, the ability to speak in an unknown language or to interpret what's being said. What is going on with all of these gifts? To prophesy is to communicate the word of God, and it can come in many ways. Teaching, conversation, preaching. Jumping a little further in this book of 1 Corinthians to chapter 14, Paul kind of shows us the difference and interweaves these together. He says, let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will only be talking to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will be mysterious. One who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but, only, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. So what is he saying here? No matter how we're communicating, our core motivation should be love for exercising those, love for God and love for each other. Our communication, no matter if it's just plain English or something very special, like speaking in the, the language of heaven, it's never about showing off. It's only about passing on the message of God in whatever way he's sharing it through us. When we do this, we learn to think about our lives from the eternal perspective. 
We can learn from someone who has the mysterious gift of speaking in another language, but we would need someone to interpret it correctly for us and someone to discern and confirm that it is truly from God. I have only heard one person speak in tongues in our church, and I didn't check with her to ask, so I'm not going to tell you who she is. <laughs> but I can confirm it was done in love. The person was praying for healing for another believer, and she spontaneously was moved to, pre to pray in the heavenly language that the Holy Spirit gave her in that moment. And we didn't have anyone with us in that little group that had the gift of interpretation to help us understand what she was praying, but I still think it was a very good experience and a thing for us to witness because it expands our knowledge of what is possible as we connect with the Lord in heaven. And that is what all the gifts are about. Romans 12 gives us more gifts. In case you didn't hear one you think you have, there's also serving, encouragement, giving, leadership, and showing compassion. If you would like to explore this further, we have some resident experts. Ken and Teresa have a ministry called Seek the Sun, and they have put together an assessment and a little class um, that you would meet maybe three or so times. So if people are interested in doing this in a community, please talk to Teresa and Ken after the service, and they can help you explore more about what your gifts might be. But first, before any of that happens, we need to answer the question. Have we opened our heart's door to welcome Jesus' presence in as our Lord and Savior? That's the first thing. And if we have, have we noticed what gifts the Holy Spirit has then brought us to connect heaven and earth? I encourage you, whether you speak with Ken and Teresa or whether you just spend time listening to the Holy Spirit to explore what God's given you and how he's inviting you to use those gifts. Just realize that this is one of the most joyful parts of the discipleship journey. And when we do this, we personally experience revival and we share that with everyone. Our spirits can become fully alive with the goodness of God. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for wanting to be with us. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for gifting us with the spirit and with special things that connect heaven and earth through us. May we search for them. May we have joy in sharing them with others for your glory and your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. receive your benediction from 1 Corinthians 1, 4-7. I am thankful to God all the time for you. I am thankful for the loving favor God has given to you because you belong to Christ Jesus. He has made your lives rich in every way, and now you have the power to speak for him. 
He gave you good understanding, and this shows that what I told you about Christ and what he can do for you has been done in your lives. You have the gifts of the Holy Spirit that you need while you wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to come again. Amen.